Suspend all extraneous activities because the time has come for Paul and Spike, two grumpy critics on Radio 6 International. Two Grumpy Critics, the media review show that stands head and shoulders above all the other media review shows hosted by homogenous white middle-aged men, thanks to one shining factor. We are not drunk. Yet. A fantastic show on the cards for you tonight, with a very special guest you're going to want to sit and listen to because... I think if you know him, your opinion may be changed by the time the hour is out. And if you don't know him yet, you're going to have a great time. But before all that, my fellow grumpy critic, Paul Higginpotham, will now serenade you with a gentle hello. 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 <laughs> How, How are, are you? you? I'm fine. Good. Glad to hear it. Our guest tonight is no stranger to followers of British local, regional and national talk radio and the name will bring forth either smiles or shudders. For our international audience who aren't familiar with the ins and outs of British talk radio, let me tell you this. He's been called highly confrontational, incredibly controversial and has earned a, quote, degree of infamy, end quote, when it comes to the talk radio phone-in format. One person even said he talks like a philosopher and looks like a farmer. Is that a bachelor's degree of infamy or a master's degree? I think a master's degree of infamy. Okay, excellent. But from a rating standpoint... And the man himself will tell you, whoever has McClue has the market. He's delivered some of the highest listening figures in Scottish radio history and even broke the phone system at one station because so many people were calling to get berated by him. (laughs) Talk show host Scotty McClue is our guest for the show tonight. And before you form an opinion on what the show is going to be like, let me assure you that we're not going to argue political shenanigans. We're not going to bark at each other about socioeconomic goings on. We're going to very gently introduce the big man himself and hope that the lovely introduction was enough to placate him and he's not going to tear into us Scotty McClue, welcome to Two Grumpy Critics How dare you talk about me like that (laughs) Here we go (laughs) Fantastic Listen, this is a huge privilege for me you guys Spike Nesmith, Paul Higginbottom, I've wanted to speak to the two of you for many a year, and here it has happened. All you have to do in radio is wait, and it will happen. <laughs> the problem I is... love your show, your show Radio 6 International, two grumpy critics, and you could not get better critics, critics or more grumpy. That used to actually be one of my uh, articulation exercises, a cricket critic. Not easy to say. Oh, my goodness, it certainly isn't. (laughs) Lemon liniment is another one. Mm -hmm. And the one that gets everybody is try to imagine an imaginary manager managing an imaginary menagerie. Oh, my goodness. (laughs) (laughs) Love to be with you, Scotty McClure, saying dinky-doo to the nation. Yes, and and dinky-doo, dinky-doo to the world, in fact. Uh, to the world, we are global tonight, of course, absolutely. Yes. We are not just an one nation, but every nation. We are every nation together under, under one umbrella. Yes. Under a group. Yep. Now, I'm used to broadcasting globally now because I'll just let you know that at 10 o'clock sharp it was. Now at 9 o'clock sharp, Greenwich Mean Time, nothing to do with the change in the hour. We've moved the show to 9 o'clock Greenwich Mean Time on a Sunday night on Scotty McClure's Facebook Live. Yes, tell us about that. Well, it was a friend of mine rang up and he said, uh, this was a year ago, virtually a year ago exactly, and he said, McClure, you're quiet. And when you're quiet, McClure, (laughs) you're up to something. (laughs) And I said, no, 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 not up to something, just working away quietly in the background because I do all sorts of various things. I do teaching, I do lecturing, I would come on to all that sort of stuff. I advise some very senior people on their media work. Mm -hmm. Uh, So that that sort of stuff, obviously, I can't give you identities, but, um, uh, you know, that's a very, very interesting point of view because you're using quite a lot of psychology and what have you at the time. Mm -hmm. I'll check that word later and see what it means. (laughs) Um, 
know, there's all that sort of thing. But, um, you know, it's, it's, it's been a fascinating time. So anyway, what I did, I said to him in my ignorance, do I need another computer? And he said, no, you go onto your Facebook page and click the icon. Mm. So I, of course, had a look around the Facebook page and, you know, after a considerable amount of time, I spotted the icon. Right. Uh, you know, that's not that the icon's difficult to spot. It's just I was looking for it. <laughs> and uh, yes, yes. So anyway, I thought to myself, right, there's the icon. And I thought I need to tidy myself up. So I got a, a handful of water and brushed my hair down, put the bonnet on straight and square. There had to be the bonnet. There had to be the bonnet. Oh, the bonnet's got to go on, otherwise people haven't got a clue. So who's that? <laughs> oh, it's Scotty McClure. Could it be George so, Clooney? <laughs> yes, yes, oh, absolutely. Oh, what? Yes, <laughs> you can't tell us apart. So um, that was that was the whole thing. Uh, anyway, when I clicked the icon, nothing happened because it then says go live. Mm -hmm. And I thought, no, this is serious. You need to really tidy yourself up, McClure. <laughs> so I had an old jumper on. It was about it was about eleven o'clock on a Saturday or Sunday evening. Anyway, we clicked go live, and just this mass of hearts and thumbs up. And Scotty, we thought you were dead. And oh, <laughs> sorry. Sort of thing. So I thought this was wonderful. Anyway. Um, I noticed that the, the figures for it, because you get very accurate figures. Um, when you're on air, you might just have a handful of people. But, of course, once you finish, it's all added together. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, it goes on building. Mm -hmm. And I looked at it, and there were several thousand people. And I thought, you know, this is actually more than you'd get on a small local radio station. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we carried on doing it. And then last week, we're only talking... The Facebook video, uh, we were about 16,000. Wow, nice. And uh, this this is very interesting. And then, of course, that um, goes up on a multiplier as you start to spread it around. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's 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 very very interesting. And what it did, um, it it just kind of raised the profile because it shows now. I think the present generation, unless the television companies are very cute will be the last generation to watch television the way our generation watched television. Mm -hmm. Well, I would agree. I think you're almost you certainly know? right. I mean, and, you know, Paul and I are both of the generation that grew up watching TV, sitting cross-legged in mm -hmm. front of the TV, but, you know, we've embraced now this new uh, video-on-demand era that's come yep. through, and, and TV's days are numbered. Traditional TV's days are numbered. I think so, because what, what actually happened, Spike and Paul, um, when the internet was new, it's actually old technology. Well, I know it's been around a long time. Uh, you know, it's not quite in its infancy, but I didn't get the internet till probably the late 1990s. Mm -hmm. And I started, you know, I've always been ahead of my time with Scotty McClure mm -hmm. and um, always like to try out the latest stuff. You know, I, I do the kind of Scottish thing of saying, yeah, I don't know, I, I'd be very good at operating that equipment. And then somebody in the room says, Scotty, you've operated multi-million pound latest equipment all your, mm -hmm. all your broadcasting life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think, so I have. <laughs> so it's a bit like you fly a plane for a living but then when somebody says, are you any good at flying? Well, it depends what kind of plane you've got. You know? <laughs> <laughs> that sort of thing. And the, 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 the internet was actually old-fashioned technology compared with AM and FM radio, which was, of course, through the airwaves. Mm -hmm. And then they started trying to force all this information down one big pipe. Mm -hmm. And you got your slow speeds. But now, <laughs> of course, the speeds are up and you're getting wireless yeah, mm -hmm. so you're back into the airwaves. The speeds are fast. This is absolutely massive. I mean, you think I'm turning out what's effectively a television program once a week for one hour, one hour of television, which you know costs very, very little to produce. Mm. And um, uh, what 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 you've got there, if you think about it, a television station has got transmitters, sales staff, cars, premises, buildings, millions of pounds, huge staff to do a production, mm -hmm. and we can now do one on a, on a good mobile phone. <laughs> and you don't have to take meter readings. 
Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, it's, just, it's just fantastic. And, and I think that um, the problem is that a lot of the contractors aren't keeping up to date with the technology. It's kind of, well, I suppose we'd better maybe do something about going on Facebook and Twitter because mm -hmm. everyone else seems to be on that. You see, yes, and Instagram and Tumblr and, you know, what have you. Right. So, and um, there's, they, they, they've been a little bit slow at that. Yeah. So you think traditional broadcasting, even radio broadcasting, is going to have to start picking up the pace a little bit? Well, you know, you'll have heard it many, many times, Spy, that um, people say, oh, big changes in radio these days. Mm -hmm. And I remember saying this to a, 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 a very, very seasoned and experienced radio practitioner. Mm -hmm. And he said, yes, that's right. Big changes, a chair and a microphone. <laughs> and of course, the thing is you can dispense with the chair. So all this <laughs> nonsense that you hear about, oh, yes, that's kind of old hat. That's of its time. Mm -hmm. The world has changed. That is actually all total bunkum. Right. Mm -hmm. So these are reasons that people will use because they don't want to hire you for their little setup. Because nowadays you've got a culture of people wanting the job, wanting the money, but not wanting to take the hit. Mm -hmm. you see? And if you're putting on, I mean, this is no criticism of, uh, of people. This is just an observation. Because one of the lovely things after 40 years in broadcasting, I do not have one ounce of anger or bitterness or fury or wanting to um, stab people in the back or wanting to crawl over folks so that I can get in a powerful position. I have never, ever had any of that because I believe if you think you're good enough, you can accept applause or derision on your merits. Mm -hmm. Right. You know? So from that point of view, so it's only an observation. And I think sometimes the companies say, no, no, we're a big company. We've got premises. We've got sales forces. We've got big expenses. We don't really want to be too quick to embrace all this sundry stuff. And you think, if you're not careful, guys, the sundry stuff will overtake what was your core business. Interesting. Interesting. Mm. Now, let me go back a little bit and talk about um, radio, our radio past and, and, and your career a little bit here. Um, Paul and I are both radio guys. We've spent a good few years in AM talk radio here in West Virginia where we're based, so we can attest to how difficult it is. I know that you had some significant acting chops plus some history with what's known as continuity at a TV station in Scotland. And continuity, for those of you playing the Paul and Spike home game, is the little promos and announcements and newscasts in between programmes. How easy or how difficult was it to transition from Good Evening, Here's the News into being a sort of fast-paced, uh, slightly confrontational figure? Slightly confrontational, we love that. Um, <laughs> it, what you've got to do is actually make a decision on that because nothing's cast in stone in broadcasting. Yeah. So I could probably ring a mainstream broadcaster tonight and say, um, are you needing somebody to read the news? I could stick on my suit and um, I might have to, uh, you know, ask them for a hairpiece or something like that <laughs> and go and read the national news with gravitas. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, that you can do that because, as you guys know, you don't lose it. You don't lose the broadcasting. You don't lose the, the, the talking to time. So what do you lose when you move from serious mainstream broadcasting into light entertainment mainstream broadcasting? Mm -hmm. The decision you've got to make is I will get laughed at. Right. That's why people give up comedy, because they get laughed at all the time. <laughs> and if you're going to get laughed at, you're also going to approach a period when people think, what is this? Because this is very creative. News gathering is very formatted. It has to be to get everything running to the second. When independent television came in, it ran to the second. It opened at 9.25 double O. Mm -hmm. Second, and then they had what was called a red phone set up. So you had 15 ITV companies, 
when Channel 4 joined us. Um, I was around when Channel 4 joined us. You had 15 ITV companies, and they would keep up to date during the day with the head of transmission in London, would then beep, 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 this phone to all the stations. They would all answer on a roll call, mm -hmm. and um, then they would adjust timings. So say, for instance, Coronation Street starts at 7.30 as far as the viewers are concerned, but it might start at 7.30, uh, 24 seconds later or something, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. depending on how the day is running. So it was a wonderful, wonderful setup. What this meant, of course, that was no matter where you lived, you could have a share on fabulous network television. Mm -hmm. And one of the wonderful practitioners of ITV, there were many of them, the television barons, as they were called at the time, because when um, Lord Thompson, the late Roy Thompson, um, who had run radio stations and newspapers in Canada and um, had bought the Times in London and also had Scottish television, he set it up. Mm -hmm. And uh, he had said, this is a license to print money. Now, the ITV companies wished he hadn't actually said that because they struggled to match the wonderful heights that Roy Thompson had reached with Scottish television. Mm -hmm. And then, in their wisdom, the controlling body, the Independent Television Authority, as it was at the time prior to the IBA, decided that, uh, that Roy Thompson had um, too many shares and too much influence. Mm -hmm. So, of course, they asked him to take some of his money out. And what happens? The business starts to struggle again mm. and that kind of madness that can just suddenly come out of uh, officialdom yeah <laughs> i think to some extent we're seeing this with all this brexit at the moment you know mm -hmm. uh, so that was that now uh, the thing is itv grew and grew and grew and one of the great practitioners you had the bernstein family running granada television in the northwest of england 5.4 million mm -hmm. and then you had um, lord grade lou grade uh, lou and leslie grade running um atv in birmingham Right. And they were real entertainment people. They knew what the people liked. Well, we Lou know Grade story. was an old music hall guy, wasn't he? Sorry? Lou Grade was an old music hall guy, wasn't he? Yes, he, he, was, he was a dancer. Charleston dancing, all that sort of stuff. But right. where he was absolutely brilliant was... Um, somebody had gone round other ITV companies trying to sell them an idea and they said, what's your program? They said, it's little puppets and they do things and go and fire and all that sort of stuff. And they said, no, we wouldn't be interested in that. They went to Lou Grade and he lit a big cigar and he said, I'll take as much of this as you can give me. Now that was Thunderbirds, Captain Scarlet and the Mistrans, Fireball XL5, Stingray, mm -hmm. you know which a whole generation, including ours, grew up to. Oh, and it made a fortune. Mm. And of course, and then, Lloyd Grade was behind the Muppets as well. The Muppets, well, yes, again, um, Jim Henson had gone along and said to do, uh, you know, uh, glove puppets and things like that, and the other companies thought, nah, that's not for us. As soon as Lou saw it, he said, I'll take as much of this as you can give me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I had no idea. And the other lovely thing, I mean, um, you know, the famous story uh, about uh, Roger Moore, sadly the late Roger Moore now, mm -hmm. but when uh, he went in to see Lou, Lou had asked him to come and see him about uh, setting up the Persuaders. Right. And, um, with Tony Curtis. Mm -hmm. And he said, I'm, I'm not really sure, Lou, that it is for me. And Lou Grade went to his desk drawer and came back and handed Roger a cheque. And he said, uh, Roger, that's for starters. And he said, Lou, when do I start? <laughs> <laughs> I wish somebody would do that to me. <laughs> yeah. ITC films, if you think about the Baron, the Champions, the Saint. Right, yeah. A yeah, lot, lot of big shows. These guys who worked solidly from five o'clock in the morning through till the evening, um, you know, and, and were great fun characters, tremendous characters, terrific businessmen, uh, and, and what have you. But they brought us several generations of superb entertainment. And supposing you lived in a little cottage on the, the, the right in the remotest part of the country, mm -hmm. you could still get to share in all this excitement. So that's why people watch television. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So... Now, you know, go on. 
No, no, I was just going to say, now, radio, mm -hmm. um, the difference between radio and television, apart from the obvious ones, everybody's shouting at their, their radios now, Spike. They're all going, we well, you know the difference. <laughs> the difference between radio and television is if you've got an appointment to listen, it's personal. So if you, say, wanted to see... Coronation Street, mm -hmm. um, you might watch Emmerdale, a bit of Emmerdale first. If you want to see Emmerdale, you may watch um, the ITN News. Mm -hmm. See, I'll just put the telly on because I'm going to watch Emma. Oh, there's the news. Oh, I didn't know that. Oh, that's interesting. And then afterwards, well, I don't normally watch this one, but I'll just watch this one as well. And that's how it runs on with all its presentation and promotion, which is what I used to do as an ITV continuity announcer and newscaster. And um, with radio, it's an appointment to listen. So if you're listening to Scotty McClue, you've decided to listen to Scotty McClue because the choice out there is astonishing. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's and astonishing it's, now. It's There's bigger than so it's ever been. Yes, it's fantastic. There's so much media out there. And if you can be a winner, as uh, I believe Scotty McClue is, mm -hmm. in media, then people will come and join you if you say, this is what we do. This is my stall set out for you. <laughs> and people then start to he's very cheeky, you know, they, they should sack him. <laughs> and then the second you do disappear, oh, that's a shame, I love that programme. Right. I know. <laughs> Love saying, mad. People love getting mad. Yeah. So we've got a decent presenter. Yeah. From you know, a, from a yeah, from you a, know, with a quarter of a million people per half hour. Yeah. Mm. Um, joining in that program, mm -hmm. and they're complaining about it. <laughs> this could be a decent program if we had a proper presenter. <laughs> <laughs> I would say, what's wrong with the program? You. <laughs> <laughs> you know, when that's I've... like the saying. No, nobody goes there anymore. It's too crowded. Right. <laughs> that's right. It's too. That's right. No wonder nobody comes here. There's just too many people. You can't get moving. <laughs> <laughs> when I first heard you, I was reminded of the Billy Connolly story about how seeing a Scottish comedian being funny in his accent inspired him to be a comedian himself and I had literally never heard a Scottish shock jock before and that shock to the system was a huge influence on me on what I wanted to do in radio you've spent a significant amount of time working on English stations what changes or tweaks do you make when you're broadcasting to an English or a national audience or indeed an international audience than when you're broadcasting to just north of the border I will work at moderating my voice so that it's not quite as broad as it is in Scotland, because as um, um, Mr. Kane from Hue and Cry, yes? Mm -hmm. Yes, Pat Kane. Uh, yes, Pat came and interviewed me for The Guardian, and he said that the language of the street flowed untrammeled. <laughs> <laughs> now, that to me was a terrific compliment. Oh, yes. It's what what is actually a compliment even uh, there was a guy used to um stay on for several hours every night and all he wanted to say is that i was sh1t <laughs> <laughs> and he stayed on for two hours to say that <laughs> That's and he just said you are and the word and then that was it and that was it <laughs> and i thought with no you are <laughs> <laughs> and that's all we had out of the call and I think two of the funniest calls if I may be allowed to become a little anecdotal Please. two of the funniest calls were um, a guy who phoned up and um, I took the call and I said Brian and he went yes and I said how are you tonight and he went angry very angry. And I said, what's what's making you angry, Brian? He went, you! And I said, why, what have I done? We've just started. He said, two hours I've been waiting. Two hours! And I said, in that case, I won't keep you a second longer and cut him off. <laughs> now, he would be absolutely furious. <laughs> because there was no way, because of the volume of calls, he would ever get through to that show again. Right. 
So there was no point in them just ringing us back or anything like that. Well, here's a question the... for you. Here's a question. <laughs> There's mm. plenty of clips floating around on the old internets of you berating callers and, you know, and, and being very sort of forward with them. Has there ever come a time when you've said to yourself, oh, I was a wee bit rough with that one, or maybe went a wee bit overboard there? Or is it a case of inconvenience for the one for the wider enjoyment of the many? I think they've phoned me. Right. They've phoned me. And if they've phoned me, then they either have to take what's coming. I mean, why don't they just hang up? Very, very rarely do they hang up. Right. I usually have to cut them off. <laughs> Now, we had a funny night one night. I'm just going to tell you the other one that I thought was rather amusing was a guy phoned one night, and I said, um, James, and I heard him. Oh, hi, Scotty. I said, are you smoking? He went, yeah, I've just sparked up. I said, well, could you put it out, please? He said, why? I said, because we're a no-smoking program, health and safety. <laughs> And uh, he said, I've just sparked up. I said, James, either you put your fag out or you go. It's entirely up to yourself. <laughs> he said, uh, OK, 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 I'm putting it out, I'm putting it out. And uh, he said, waste of a fag. I said, well, you shouldn't be smoking anyway, James. <laughs> so then we took the call. James was happy, and away he went. Mm -hmm. And um, the next thing, a guy phones up and he goes, what are you at, McClure? Now, the fact he felt he could do that means the program's working. Right. <laughs> and I mean, what am I at? He went, that guy, said, oh, the smoker. He went, he was in his house. I said, I don't care where he was. I said, there are people listening that might have bad chest. <laughs> <laughs> and said, oh, yeah, right enough, OK. And, and, and put himself off. <laughs> now, you know, the idea that that fag smoke could come through the radio and, and, and people would be getting second-hand smoke. <laughs> it's, a, it's a beautiful theatre of the mind, isn't it? Mm. <laughs> and you've just hit it, Spike, absolutely. It is the theatre of the mind. You yeah. know, what is actually happening? Another night with a guy phoned, nice guy, but he said, um, uh, for some reason best known to himself, he came on, we could all hear him clear as a bell. He went, hello, 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 Scotty, can you hear me? Hello? No, no, oh, there's something wrong with his phone. There's something wrong with his phone. I said, hello? Oh, hello, you're there, Scotty. Sorry, Scotty, I think there's something wrong with the phone. So I went quiet. I could hear him fine, but I went quiet. He went, hello, hello, hello. Oh, no, he's gone, he's gone. And I said, hello? Oh, hello, Scotty, you're still there, thank goodness. I think there's something wrong with the phone. I said, do you have another phone in the house? There's nothing wrong with his phone. He said, just the one in the bedroom. I said, why don't you try that? So we could hear the feet going up the stairs. <laughs> then we had the extension being picked up. And an out of path guy says, hello, hello, Scotty, is that any better? I said, I think the one downstairs is actually clearer. <laughs> OK. <I'll... laughs> now, that wasn't the end of it. Three times we had him up and down the stairs. <laughs> The listeners know what's going on, but the poor soul didn't. But nevertheless, he was going along with it. Right, right. <laughs> you see, so there's a wee element of naughtiness in McClue. There's a wee touch of mischief. Mm -hmm. But I don't think it's harmful. Right. No, I don't think it's harmful at all. <laughs> Making people go up and down stairs all day. <laughs> no. I think it wasn't the smoker you did that to. <laughs> <laughs> but you know that's the kind of thing that's out there because if you think about it we have a huge um raft of loneliness across the world at the moment mm -hmm. because relationships go under pressure they go under strain people break up people divorce people die people take ill a lot of people end up living alone and their lives are not terribly bright as far as they're concerned. Mm -hmm. And I think that if you've got a national phone-in or an international phone-in or a local radio phone-in, 
because radio is radio. It's a chair and a microphone, and we can dispense with the chair mm-hmm. at a push. <laughs> you know, and if people feel that there's somebody that they can talk to, that they can trust. I mean, we've talked about the funny side of the calls because there's a lot of humour and a lot of entertainment. But I like to think there's information, education, and entertainment. And at the end of it, they know that they can trust Scotty McClue because he lets all his prisoners go at the end of the night. Mm-hmm. You know, because we're going to do it all again the next night. Right. Right. So everybody needs to be fine and get a good sleep and say they've actually enjoyed themselves. Um, and if you're sitting on your own in a tiny flat and, and, and money's very tight and you're very challenged and that's your entertainment, I believe that entertainment should be as of higher standard as they would get if they were going out to the Carnegie Hall. Right. Right. Interesting. So we've you talked know? about the uh, the smokers and we've talked about mm. the guy going up and down the stairs mm. and the guy who'd been on hold for a long time. <laughs> yes. What are the strangest or most disturbing calls you've ever taken? A guy phoned me one night to say his father had died and could he talk to me about it? Mm-hmm. And I said, yes, of course. And then as we talked on a bit, he was obviously quite distressed. And I said, when did your father pass away? And he said, just over half an hour ago. Wow. <clears throat> now, his first thought was to ring somebody that he felt he could talk to, and that was Scotty McClue. Mm -hmm. Now, that is very, very humbling. I know I come across as a bit of a blowhard and all the rest of it. That's entertaining. (laughs) You know, a bit of a blowhard. I'm also the world's most humble man. Right. (laughs) And the first lord of the internet. (laughs) Yes, the first lord of the internet and the world's top broadcaster, don't forget. Present (laughs) company, accepted and accepted. (laughs) Before we let you go tonight, we decided that in order to get you fully integrated into the show, and instead of giving you just one media question to ponder, because we usually give out a media question and let the audience and let our guests discuss it, we decided we'd give you a rapid-fire number of previous topics for you to rattle through to get a rough idea of of who you are and where you are from, from a media consumer standpoint. Right. So, first question. What movie or TV show would you like to see rebooted? Movie or TV show would I like to see rebooted? Um, <clears throat> you've really got me there because there's so many fabulous movies around. Any of the Alistair McLeans are tremendous. Mm-hmm. So, uh, Guns of Navarone, Puppet in a Chain, um, a Richard Burton... Give me that one again. Where Eagles Dare. Oh, yeah. You know, you're on the edge of your seat with these. Ice Station Zebra. Mm. Mm-hmm. You know, you're on the edge of your seat with an Alistair McLean. Um, and obviously, it's some time since these movies were brought out. But they're great movies. Another fabulous movie is Remains of the Day. Oh. Oh, yeah. You know, and with Anthony Hopkins and Emma Thompson. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Set in the big house um, during the appeasement. Uh, Anthony Hopkins plays Mr. Stevens, the butler. Mm-hmm. Emma Thompson, the housekeeper. You know? Mm-hmm. And uh, fabulous, fabulous movie. So I like the ones that make us work. The ones that you think, what's going on here? Mm. Yeah. Didn't uh, didn't McLean do Force 10 from Navarone as well? Wasn't that his? First time from Navarone. What I loved about that one, Edward Fox playing Sergeant Miller, the explosives expert. Yes. Yeah. And he's lying up, the, the dam didn't blow. And he's lying up in the hills above the dam, smoking his pipe. And they said, well, you know, obviously that was a fail or whatever words were used in the script. And he said, give it time, dear boy. <laughs> <laughs> What it was was his explosions had weakened the wall and the weight of water would do the rest. Mm. And that's become of a motto for me. Give it time, dear boy. (laughs) Nice. You know, when somebody says, this guy's just climbing over every day and stabbing every day in the back and saying terrible things and all the rest of it, I say, give it time, dear boy. (laughs) (laughs) 
<laughs> what is your media guilty pleasure? My media guilty pleasure. I am a bit of a TV freak. I've got to be. I've got to be honest. And I'm a bit of a radio freak. What I used to do. I was in the happy position of working seven days a week and actually did a 25-hour day. Oh. I got to bed at three o'clock in the morning and got up at six. I went to London from Sheffield, had a meeting, came back to Sheffield, had some supper, went out and did a show and then drove to Glasgow. Right. And, um, you know, you, you have to keep on the go for that. But there are pluses to it. One is you're, dri you're driving through the night, so you haven't got the traffic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I did this for, oh, for, you know, a good two or three years. Anyway, uh, it was wonderful stuff. You just have to take things in your stride. You know, you can't be angry or upset or think poor me or any of that nonsense because you know you're doing very well at what you've chosen to do right and during the night there's all sorts of things on the radio and you can just go right through the whole radio dial and one of the best ones was an irish phone-in called open line mm -hmm. you know and um, they were interviewing a politician and said now on open line tonight and he's gone i don't care what they put on open line <laughs> you know, and I thought he's obviously heard it, and this is another thing. Um, wives used to dob their husbands in; they used to grass their husbands up. So you would meet them, and you'd say, "Oh, Scotty, how are you, son? We love your show." And then uh, the husband would go, "I, I don't listen, Scotty. I don't like what you do." And she's, "Oh, Scotty's a terrible liar. He never misses it." <laughs> Now, one night I came out of a little Christmas Eve service, a little mass and um, or watch night service, depending what you like to call it. Hmm. And it was a little country churchyard near where I lived. Mm -hmm. And um, I heard hissing from behind a gravestone, oh. which is a little bit anxiety making at one o'clock in the morning <laughs> in, in, in a little country churchyard. Sst, sst. And I thought, what's that? And then this lady appeared with her daughter. She said, Scotty. She didn't want the rest of the parishioners to see this. Mm -hmm. Scott, we've bought your video for Christmas for my husband. <laughs> Could you sign it? And she produced a pen. Mm -hmm. So I said, yes, of course I can. And I said, um, is he a big fan? And she went, no, he hates you. <laughs> <That's what> <laughs> Now, isn't that a funny thing? So it actually doesn't matter whether the listeners love you or hate you as long as they listen. Exactly. Right. Exactly. Right. exactly. Yeah. Well, that leads me on to my next question. What is mm. the strangest or most interesting thing you've ever heard on radio? Um, I'm going to say I've heard many interesting and strange things, including open line. Right. But... Um, what was uh, one of the things I've heard? I'm actually going to choose something from a program of my own. Oh. It was a lady that rang. And although you've got to be quite a talker, you're actually a listener. Your listening comes before you're talking. So you're listening like mad for mm -hmm. clues as to the person you're dealing with so that you know how to handle them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, two ears and one mouth in that proportion. And I was listening to that man, and this lady came on, and I said, uh, you know, Mary, how are you tonight? Uh, okay. I said, are you sure you're okay? Uh-huh. I said, you don't sound okay to me, me. Oh, I'm fine. I said, Mary, why are you not telling me what's wrong? Um, it's personal. I said, all right. I said, personal, what way? Is it emotional? Is it medical? Personal, don't want to discuss it. So I said, <laughs> is it, is it, have you got a condition, Mary? Yes, but I don't want to discuss it. <laughs> and then for some reason, Spike, I said, Mary, have you got Crohn's disease? Huh. And there was a pot, and she said, how could you possibly come out with that? It's taken doctor seven years to diagnose that. Huh. And for some reason, I just felt this lady had Crohn's disease. 
wow. which of course is uh, where there's necromosis in the intestine. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. You know, and um, I don't know why I came out and she had Crohn's disease. And that was freaky. That is kind of freaky, yeah. Wow. Yeah. Because I don't know where it came from. Wow. In the intestines, I would imagine. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> I, I, I don't know, Spike, where that, that came from in my head or why <laughs> I even said it. That could be a whole new career is just being like a, one of these uh, psychics. Diagnosing people. Diagnosing people, <laughs> yeah. yes. I was going to say, I've got this pain in my right knee, Scotty. Can you uh, can you help me out with that right now? Any ideas? Yeah, it's the way. Just looking at you because we've got no visual contact. I'm just looking at you, Paul, and I'm thinking about the way you're sitting. <laughs> <laughs> Scotty, it's been absolutely wonderful having you on the show. Paul's I would uh, knee. love to have you come back and talk about Paul's knee. <laughs> The Battle of Wounded Knee. Yes. <laughs> we'll do a whole hour on Paul's ailments next time. Yes. Oh, uh, fantastic stuff. But no, I mean, I hope that just, it's its very difficult to scratch the surface, guys, but I hope that sheds a little bit of light on, on the whole setup. Oh, definitely. Absolutely it does, yes. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah. Between that you know, and Wikipedia, I think we're, uh, I think we're, we're both experts now. Yep. I think we're done here is what you're going to say. <laughs> <laughs> Sticking a fork in it, it's done. <laughs> we won't keep you a minute longer. <laughs> so we both, both well within your rights at the end of this to put off of the, oh my goodness, I thought he was never going to stop. <laughs> <laughs> Would we do that? We actually use any of this on our broadcast. <laughs> we'll use at least a couple of minutes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, that's very good of you. That's more than I'm used to. <laughs> All right, Scotty, thank you so much for coming on the show. We'll talk to you soon. Guys, it's been a privilege, and as we say in all the finest circles, dinky-doo. Dinky-doo yeah. to you, sir. Thank you, Scotty. Thank you. Bless you both. <laughs> there we go. Scotty McClure, the man, the myth, the legend. Oh, great stuff. Yes, stuff. indeed. So... Don't forget you can join the throngs of people clamouring to get into the Two Grumpy Critics VIP lounge by visiting the long shortcut, which is vip.paulandspike.com. That's vip.paulandspike.com. Once you're there, you can revel in the wonderland of seeing the show question first, discussing weeks and stuff, and also... Well, that's about it, really. You should totally join. Yeah. Time for This Week in Stuff, the section of the show where we all get together and compare our media weeks. Going, got, got need to the TV shows and films and books and video games we've consumed over the last seven. Your week's in a minute, but first to Paul. Okay. Couple of, uh, so a little bit of TV, a little bit of movies, a little bit country, a little bit rock and roll. <laughs> um, the Good Place. Remember I told you I was watching that on Netflix? Yeah. That uh, TV series with Ted Danson and uh, I can't her name just uh, escaped me. Kristen Bell? Kristen Bell, so, yes. Yeah, okay. Anyway. Uh, Kind of a good show. I uh, it, it was enough to keep me going through all of season one, and season one ends with quite a bang. Oh. Um, the show is a few years old, so I, I don't think it's going to be a, a huge spoiler, but I won't wreck it in case anybody does want to catch up late. But uh, safe to say there is a, a pretty decent twist at the very end of the show, mm -hmm. and it is a cliffhanger heading into season two, which I believe is on the air now, but it hasn't made it to Netflix yet. Right. So the twist was enough to, to make me want to see what happens next. Could get interesting. Mm -hmm. Also been watching the Orville, of course. Every oh, yes. episode, I like the Orville and the cast a lot better. It's just a fun show. It's 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 a group of people that you would just like to hang out with, that you just like being around. And they just happen to be on a spaceship doing sci-fi things. Okay. <laughs> really, really like the, the Orville. Legends of Tomorrow. Remember I told you I wasn't quite sure how I felt about that one. Yeah, yeah, that the uh, Marvel show. Yeah, that was the one where they had to kill the guy who was immortal, and you know it was every week. You knew he, they weren't going to kill him because the the drama would be over. So it was sort of like Gilligan's Island, where you just had to wait and see how they were going to fail that week. And the the season culminating culminated in or with them finally achieving their main goal, and then it immediately gives them another goal, which 
I, I, it's almost it's almost like they got near the end of the season one and they weren't sure if they were going to be renewed or not. <laughs> right. So so they, they wrote the last episode just as they got the email like, ding, you're on for season two. <laughs> like, OK, let's add this bit at the end where we have this cliffhanger and don't get on the ship or you're going to die. <laughs> and I'm from the future and bye bye. <laughs> and the only thing, you know, Legends of Tomorrow assembles a fun cast and some really neat superhero characters, the B-listers. They're all fun to watch, and I could watch Katie Lott's Untangle Kite String. Yes. Um, but the, the thing that really bores me is is I'm, I'm pretty much done with time travel. The time travel mm. tropes are getting old, although this one does create some of its own rules, which makes it a little bit more palatable. Uh, rules such as you can't keep going back in time to the same event over and over and over to try to change it or fix it or fix what you broke. It's like they had these rules that seem very arbitrary, but they make it uh, easier to handle. Like you can only go back in time to a certain event once. Right. If you do, if you do it again, then you're going to cause a time paradox and everything. It's like crossing the streams. Everything goes. Yeah. So I, I'm done with time travel, but I like the characters enough to keep going. I did say adios to a show that I've been watching for several years. Finally, it was a heartbreaking separation, but I finally have had to give it the Dear John letter, and that is The Flash. Oh, really? I told you. You remember last year through last season, I kept saying, I don't know if I'm going to keep stick with it. I don't know if I can stick with it. It's getting pretty ugly. Yeah. And I was excited about season one, and season one happened, and it's it's just horrible. Um, I'll get into it more later. We have more time, but I, I finally just had to say goodbye. They they took one of the main characters and made her even more insufferable, <laughs> and uh, just changed the tenor of the show. And I just had to pull the ripcord. No, that's a shame. Yeah, a couple of Halloween themed things. I saw a fine feature film from 2014, an Australian film that you may have heard of called The Babadook. Oh, I've been wanting to see that. <laughs> um, I kept seeing references to this all over the internet. You know, it's it's part of pop culture now, the, the Babadook. Mm. And so I had to see what it was all about. And it's the perfect time of season to try it. And honestly, days later after seeing it, I can't tell you what I think of it. <laughs> I mean, it's it's very exorcist-esque in that it involves a child and it involves something either supernatural or psychological that is making the child go crazy. And it's very, very much like watching Linda Blair just go crazy and science is unable to figure out why. Um, it, it, so it reminded me a lot. The, the tone is a lot like The Exorcist. It's very disturbing, not so much frightening, but just unsettling. Right. And there are, a couple, there are a couple of startles and like, ooh, when you see the Babadook, but it's not overdone. They, they, they very smartly keep it hidden with only a couple of glimpses here and there because the you know, what you don't see is always scarier than what you do see. Um, but, you know, if you're into horror films and you want something just to make you feel a little creepy, then uh, I, I would definitely give it a look. Mm -hmm. And it's a, a cast of no names, which makes it interesting, I think. That's good, because th that way it's not distracting, mm -hmm. because it's not like... I mean, it, it's in that situation where there's people that you don't know who they are. Yeah. Then it's the character who's getting a fright or the character who's getting chopped up. It's not exactly. Tom Cruise who's getting a fright. Right. It makes it a little bit more realistic. You feel real because you you think that this could be an average person. Yeah. This this horror is happening to an average person, not a movie star. That makes it a little bit more intimate. The one thing I will note, though, is that when you watch this, one of the first things that I noticed is the set is very German impressionism. Almost the house that the main characters live in. Uh -huh. I made I made a comment to my wife. I said, this is this is actually creepy. By itself. I mean, the, the house is creepy without anything scary happening to it. It's just the, the way the walls are painted and the way it's decorated and everything just looks like it's slightly at a wrong angle or it's just the, the, like like if you looked at the baseboards, they probably wouldn't quite fit. Yeah. You know, it's 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 just a very unsettling place they live in even before the, the scares start to happen. So worth a look for hmm. sure for horror fans, especially. And I listened to a gem. Speaking of uh, cool things you hear on the radio. Yeah. This past week, um, you know, Halloween time means old time radio thrillers for me. And I listened to a great episode of suspense. Oh, from, I love suspense. From 1942. This one was The Hitchhiker. Uh huh. And if that sounds familiar, that's because it uh, is a radio play that was written by Lucille Fletcher, and it was put on several times on the radio by none other than Orson Welles. Ah. But it was also 
adapted for a 1960 episode of The Twilight Zone. Right. Yeah, in the in the Twilight Zone, you'll remember it was a girl driving across country in the car and she keeps seeing the same man who's hitchhiking. In the radio play, it's a man and on the episode of Suspense that I heard, it's Orson Welles as the main character. Mm. And he does a very meta introduction to it, which I really enjoyed where he was talking about, you know, for some reason I have received the reputation of being a master of the thriller and he said maybe it has something to do with a little radio play I did involving a couple of planets, which will remain nameless. <laughs> <laughs> but, but it's really neat. It's not the first time he did it on his own show on the Orson Welles show on CBS in 1941, but uh, he re reprised the role for the 1942 episode of Suspense. Music by Bernard Herrmann mm -hmm. of Hitchcock fame, great Hitchcock partner. Yeah. And um, yeah, really good stuff. Uh, Bernard Herrmann was actually married to the woman who wrote the play. Oh, which right. I, I, did, I did not know. But uh, top-notch stuff there. How about your weekend stuff? Uh, well, thanks to second-hand binge-watching, I've caught a bit of a chunk of the show Riverdale this past week. Oh, the Archie thing. Yes. Archie. Hey. Now, I initially had it uh, recommended to me by Heather, our comics consultant at Black Mirror Comics in Mill Creek, Washington State, just outside yeah. Seattle. So Better hurry. Better hurry. <laughs> hey, where are you going? I'm going to Black Mirror Comics in Mill Creek, Washington State, just outside Seattle. So I knew it had some connection to the Archie comics. And I was yes. going in afresh to Riverdale because I was only really fleetingly aware of the Archie comics and the cartoon series that went with it. Uh, which was one of the reasons I didn't immediately jump up and start watching the series, because I had no real great connection to it. Right. Um, I knew there was a bloke called Archie, obviously. I knew there was a guy called Jughead, yeah. and that he played the drums or some such musical instrument, but nothing else apart from that. Turns out that Riverdale the series is only really tenuously connected to the comics itself, mostly just in names alone. Archie's there, Jughead's there, Venor v Venorica... How about Veronica? And <laughs> even, Veronica is, is in southern Italy, I think. It's beautiful. <laughs> right. Lovely vintage grapes. Even Cheryl Blossom. But they're not, to my knowledge, personality ports from the cartoon even. All in all, it's actually a pretty enjoyable series for what's essentially a teen soap. The drama is ramped up high, because they are teens after all. And they're all throwing high school keggers and sleeping with each other and dying or as I like to call it, Wednesday. But, yeah, it's all right. It's good fun. doesn't take itself too seriously, and it's filled with the stars of yesteryear mostly, I would assume, to keep the Generation X numbers up. For, exa uh, for example, Luke Perry is somebody's dad. Uh, uh -huh. Maid Chinamic is a mum. Molly Ringwald comes a-calling as Archie's estranged mother. But the biggest mind-blowing moment was realising that Jughead was played by a guy called Cole Sprouse. Now, the name may mean nothing to you, O Vienna, but if you were a kid in the early 2000s, or if you were a parent in the early 2000s, you may recognise this now 25-year-old actor as being one half of Zack and Cody from the Disney Channel's Sweet Life series. I'll be darned. For my money, one of the least annoying and actually very nicely written Disney sitcoms of that era from a comedy standpoint. Now... I have to file Riverdale under G for guilty pleasure because okay. it's a great fun series that doesn't take itself too seriously as I say and I mean Luke Perry's not leaning into the camera wiggling his fingers and going low quality whilst he gives a big theatrical wink <laughs> but you can certainly tell that no one's expecting an Emmy from it it's just a bit of fun and that translates beautifully onto the screen so I give it three and a half dead quarterbacks out of five. Oh, nice yeah also got to see something I've been uh, looking forward to watching for a little while this week, mm -hmm. and that is the new Ghostbusters. Oh, yes. Now, as usual, I'm behind the times when it comes to reviewing new movies, and so before Ghostbusters, let's talk about Citizen Kane. <laughs> Not really. This week, I enjoyed my free copy of 2016's Ghostbusters thanks to the new digital copy collation service Movies Anywhere, who gave me a copy of Ghostbusters and some other movies just for connecting my Voodoo and Amazon video to it. 
God bless them. Absolutely. It's neat. If you have access to it, give it a try. If you happen to have digital movies on multiple platforms, give it a whirl. You get five free movies out of it. And the one thing it did for me as a big Chromecast user is years ago before I adopted Chromecast, I w- bought a couple of movies on Amazon mm-hmm. and I couldn't play them anywhere easily because there's no easy Chromecast capable Amazon app. But now the Amazon movies transferred over to Movies Anywhere so I can pull up that app, Chromecast my Amazon movies. Take that, Bezos. <laughs> there you go. And Bob's your auntie's live-in lover. Yes. Um, I don't know what service Ghostbusters was on, if it was Amazon or if it was Voodoo, but my Voodoo movies I always had all sorts of trouble with. Mm. They would buffer and they would stutter. Mm. And if you paused it and then unpaused it, you would go make a cup of tea and came back and unpaused it, it would suddenly be a different part of the movie. So I never had any great luck with Voodoo, but this worked beautifully. Nice. I want to compare it to Google Play Movies because Google Play performance-wise works great, but there's a lot of black crush in the video. It's like they compress it. That was an R.E.M. song, wasn't it? I think so, yeah. Yeah. So there you go. Here endeth the commercial. Okay. Now, I'm a tough nut to crack when it comes to remakes and reboots, but I was determined to go into this one with an open mind since so many people had given it rave reviews. And that was really, really hard to do, since I'm generally of the opinion that remakes of great movies invariably don't ever need to be made. And because I love the original, and I even liked its unpopular sequel so much. Which is a fight I will never finish fighting. (laughs) And of course, we had that other hurdle, the fact that I'm not particularly much of a fan of Melissa McCarthy. I'm sure she's a lovely person, I've yet to find the piece of media that she's been in that I liked, and that includes her impression of Sean Spicer that consisted of, yes, some amazing makeup, but absolutely no substance past that. Spicer didn't yell, I don't get it, and the mobile lectern weaking about all over the place? What? (laughs) But I digress. Okay. I'll say this, if the original hadn't have existed, New Ghostbusters really, really would have been a great, solid film. It would have been a riot. Problem is, a great film with the same name and a similar plot came before it, and it was really good. Now, that's not to say the new one is bad. Performances are, for the most part, good, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Direction's fine. Script is pretty good. It's just that it's not really Ghostbusters. Ghostbusters exists already. What does work for the new one is that it's not an exact shot-for-shot remake and that it ploughs its own furrow, although there's parts that are similar, like the hearse and the logo and some of the origins. If they had set it in the same universe as the original and had a sort of cross between a reboot and a sequel, maybe I would have been more comfortable with it, which is not to say I hated it, it just sort of didn't sit right. I suppose it's kind of like the American remake of The Office, which I've never seen, so I I may need to be swiftly corrected, but I'm told it went off in its own direction and found success after remaking just one or two episodes of the original to get going. Hmm. So, I don't know. Performances in the new Ghostbusters are, as I say, good enough, although the bloke who plays the receptionist is really annoying, as are all frustrating, blithering idiots on film. (laughs) Seriously, when has there ever been a character in a film that's a total and utter moron and you've come away thinking you know what character i enjoyed spending a full 90 minutes with the halfwit more please more (laughs) melissa mccarthy as usual mistakes volume for funny the rest of the cast i've got no prior experience with and no beef with after seeing the film but i tell you what i felt like i was being hit over the head with cameos though uh word up (laughs) we everybody say One or two discreet appearances would have been fine. Cute even. But it seemed like someone or something notable was there every two minutes with a snappy, incredibly meta line to deliver right into the camera. Was Stan Lee in it? (laughs) I wouldn't be surprised if he was. (laughs) Not in the least. (laughs) Wrong film. That's right. Hands. (laughs) I can't believe I'm here. Two, Two women on each arm. Yeah. It reminded me of, of all things, District 9. Oh. Remember that feeling you got after you saw District 9? That whole, ouch, I've just been pummeled with social commentary. That feeling. Yeah. Imagine that, 
but with executive producer Dan Aykroyd et al, et al, et al, ad infinitum. And that's all the Latin I know. So in conclusion, I'm glad I finally saw it. I've been meaning to see it for a long time. The price was right for sitting down with a wee cup of tea and taking it all in. Was it fun? Yes. Was it clever? Um, Yeah. Do I need to see it again? No, probably not. I was going to give it three cameos out of five, but there's more than five cameos in the bleeding thing, so instead I'll give it three dollar store glow stick PK meters out of five. (laughs) And that's two grumpy critics for another week. Thank you again to Scotty McClure for joining us for the show. Don't forget to keep in touch via the usual address, which is... The usual address at gmail.com. And, of course, the VIP lounge on Facebook, vip.paulandspike.com, vip.paulandspike.com. A Radio 6 international production from the USA. Copyright 2017.